that's I'm interested in a lot of other aspects of our freshwater ecosystems, algae, cyanobacteria. So these uh, are all topics of my interest, but botany, I guess, is what I'm focusing on today. And it's been through my research in the Willistook and the Fredericton region that I discovered Eurasian water milfoil in the Willistook in 2015. We'll talk today about the initial discovery and what we've watched for colonization since then. So to start off, what is Eurasian water milfoil? Maybe you've heard of this. It has gotten quite a bit of uh, media attention in the past couple of years and thanks to the work of the MBSIC, uh, we're raising a lot of awareness for this invasive aquatic plant in our region. But to make sure we're all on the same page, let's define what Eurasian water milfoil is. Eurasian water milfoil is an invasive aquatic plant, and as Ben pointed out today, tonight is a theme of aquatic. So this plant lives just under the water. It's not a riparian zone plant that is in shorelines or, or ditches. This is a submerged aquatic plant, and it looks like a bottle brush. If you're a paddler in this region or a boater, you've probably encountered it. But there are about eight, nine other species of milfoil in this region. So milfoil is the genus name. And milfoil refers to a group of plants with this bottle brush-like look. But what makes Eurasian water milfoil, Myriophyllum spicatum, different is that it is much more invasive than other milfoils. When you see other milfoils growing, they often tend to cluster in a cove or slow moving waters. But as you'll see today, this plant is much more robust and it's considered invasive in many regions. So it's called Eurasian because it's from Eurasia, Europe and Asia, but it's been introduced to every other continent in the world except for Antarctica. And on all of those continents, it is an invasive species outside of its native range. And this plant was on my radar when I started doing botanical surveys with the Canadian Rivers Institute because our watershed, New Brunswick uh, Alliance of Lake Association, which is a group of, I think, 14 watershed groups are in this lakes association. They produced something called the top 10 most unwanted aquatic invasive plant list. So this was done through their invasive plant uh, patrol program, ETF funded work that was happening, I think in about 2012 or 2014. And to make this list, they looked around us uh, as we're doing for other invasive species and looking at issues that Ontario, Quebec, Maine, and other provinces, other jurisdictions are facing. And we don't have to look far to see the issues that this plant is causing. Quebec invested $8 million alone in 2018 just in management of this invasive species. Now, management does not equal eradication, right? And management is awfully done for recreational uses and doesn't maintain the integrity of the ecosystem. That's a lot of money to pay just to be able to manage it. And that's not all populations, that's on selected lakes. This plant's also been called the zombie plant by the media, which as a botanist makes me kind of laugh because zombie just seems like a strange term to apply to a plant, but it's called the zombie plant because it's so hard to kill, because you can knock that back to small few fragments that reside in the sediment and the plant will survive. So it's like it's dead, but then it comes back to life. So this was one of the province's top 10 most unwanted aquatic invasive species. So I memorized this list before I went out and I, I say aquatic, these are invasive plants because I guess there's um, giant hogweed is also on there, but about five of these plants. And then if you include the, the iris, which can live in boggy environments, we would say are, are aquatic. So this plant was then on my radar and unfortunately I found it while doing my surveys in the Woolstick River. And I was able to identify this plant from the native plants because of these details, the morphological features. So what makes Eurasian water milfoil different than other milfoils, like its closely related sister species, northern water milfoil, are these features. So it's got four leaves per whorl. So if you look at this white stem here on the left and you follow that out and inside that red circle are four leaves. Each one of these is a leaf. They occur in fours, occasionally fives. Now there are other species of milfoils that have 
worlds of four. Sometimes so they only have three, sometimes they have five. Um, what makes this one distinct is it's got over 12 what are called pinnae. So if you count these pins up one side of a leaf, then if it's over 12, then it's Eurasian water milfoil. So that told me right off the bat, as soon as I seen it, we had Eurasian water milfoil in this area. And based on what's reported in the literature from elsewhere, it seems to prefer slower moving waters, typically up to three meters deep, but up to 10 in clear waters. But our research has shown that it's actually thriving in a river environment. And I think this is actually just a bias about what's been reported in the literature about it liking slow moving waters. Uh, because it also thrives in river environments. Slow waters are, are definitions usually of lakes, where just by chance, that's where this plant's been introduced to at the majority of locations. And the problem with this plant is, as you can see here, it grows to the water surface, then it grows along the surface and it forms these really dense mats. And obviously, if you're a property owner and you want to, to swim or even like boating or fishing, this can be problematic. Okay not to mention for the organisms that live there. And here's just an example of an invasive Eurasian water milfoil here on the right, growing right next to the native, uh, native water milfoil. So both do grow to high densities, but the invasive Eurasian water milfoil tends to take it a bit further and can colonize a wider range of habitats. Whereas the native northern water milfoil does tend to stay in slower moving waters. And Although we often think of plants as creepy and gross when we're swimming in the water, plants are important habitat for other species, just as the forest is important uh, for birds, for other animals. This is important for fish and invertebrates that live within the aquatic system. It's grounds for reproduction, for breeding, for shelter from sun, um, for thermal control. So plants do play an important part in the aquatic ecosystem. So what then is the, the problem with Eurasian water milfoil specifically? And I, I alluded to it grows to really high densities. And here's an image of a marina down in Michigan. On the bottom part of this photo, you would think you're almost looking at a wetland, but alas, you're not. This is a marina that has been taken over by Eurasian water milfoil. And when this happens, that aquatic ecosystem doesn't function the same way that it did before. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not a, a functioning aquatic ecosystem, but it is different. There may be different species there now. It, it competes native floras and obviously changes the recreational and aesthetic values. It can lower property values and water quality. We often think of plants as oxygenating water, but when plants die and die back, they actually consume water or sorry, consume oxygen in the water. So uh, through respiration, they actually deplete the oxygen in the water. And that's obviously uh, an issue for any other aquatic species that depends on oxygen to live. So these plants can grow to such high densities that they affect water quality. They also provide substrate, substrate for things like cyanobacteria and algal growth. So here's an example, a, a local example in the Willistook of Eurasian water milfoil taking over. So on the picture on the left, I'm out in one of my favorite sites with a few students. We're doing an aquatic botany workshop. This was an ideal site to teach students how to identify aquatic plants. It had some rare plants as shown here on the right, Panamagetan prey longus and Elodia natale. And it was a great shallow waist deep area where I could take students where we could still see the plants and find some interesting things to ID in the water was calm and clear. Uh, just my absolute favorite spot on the Willistook. And two years later, here's what happened when Eurasian water milfoil moved in. So on the photo on the right, it's taken from pretty much the same angle. This is a, a cove. The one on the left is veering a little bit more to the left, but I think you get the idea. You can see how that open water is now closed off. What looks like algal growth on the top of the water is in fact algae, but it's growing on top of the Eurasian water milfoil. So the Eurasian water milfoil is then providing a substrate for algal growth and proliferation. Now, obviously I can't use this site for teaching the same way that I used to. And I can no longer find those rare species 
it's possible that they are still there somehow, but I can't sort through the plant matter to find them. And so maybe, maybe they are and maybe they're not. But unquestionably, this cove has changed as the result of an introduction of Eurasian water milfoil. Here's that antivirus again. <clears throat> so what makes it such a successful invader? Well, that's because primarily it can spread really fast and colonize because it spreads by fragmentation. So fragmentation is just like if you've ever taken a cutting from a friend's plant and, and put it in water and let it root before you plant it. This plant does that all naturally. So it's got these zones where it breaks off and spreads, but then humans help it out when we cut it up with our boat motors. Every fragment can become an entirely new plant. And these fragments can stick to boats and boat trailers. My team did a survey in 2019 of boats in the Fredericton region. And this included self-reporting boats from our research teams, which we always clean, drain, dry, and examine. We also attended events. And between 30 and 40% of the boats coming off the water had fragments of Eurasian water milfo. So that's how colonized and well established it is here. There's fragments everywhere. And so this fragment that you're looking at on the left has these white roots coming out for, from nodes. And this fragment could even break into as many as seven different plants if that's how little it just takes one of these nodes one of these little areas with roots to create an entire new plant and so these plants then as i said hitchhike uh, through boat traffic primarily is thought to new water courses but also this happens now with ice scour once we have populations of this plant established uh, along a littoral zone uh, ice scour will break this up each year creating more fragments that float down the river and establish. And this plant is really good at establishing because it grows quite a bit faster than other plants. And then when it does, thanks to this characteristic of it growing along the surface of the water, it shades other plants. And so it outcompetes. And you can see here right beside the white bubble about halfway up, there's some lily pads starting to come to the surface but they're not quite making that there yet. The Eurasian water milfoil is very well established shading what is below. It's also got broad environmental tolerance. So just out of curiosity, I sent uh, my students and uh, technician, Mark Gotro, who now works with DFO, out to sample the Mactaquac marina to see what Eurasian water milfoil was doing under the ice. So most plants in the fall will die back to um, the, the root base or the plants turn brown in the cold water and aren't photosynthesi photosynthesizing and aren't actively growing. But when we dropped a, a claw rake like thing below the ice and to a known plant bed of Eurasian water milfoil, we pulled it up. These fragments that we pulled up were green and lush and ready to go at a time when most other plant life would have died back. And in addition to that, before that fragment had even broken off of the plant, it was already growing these adventitious roots. So it was just essentially waiting for ice scour or waiting for something to break it up further. And then all of those fragments were ready to instantly give rise to another plant. So it thrives in winter, but it also thrives in flowing water conditions. There is a limit there in the river. Obviously, there's a, a sheer stress element where things become too hostile for plant life, but it does like a wide range of flows. It, I've seen it growing in rocky substrates and soft substrates and in different uh, water quality zones. So it's got a broad environmental tolerance, which speaks to its resiliency. And I've actually forgotten fragments of the plant in my fridge at work for, for two years, uh, things that I was using as teaching specimens. And so they're in the fridge in the cold and the dark in a jar and I take them out and they're ready to go. They're still lush and green with roots and still viable and can resume growth. So it's uh, a pretty resilient plant compared to most. So now let's look at this plant in terms of New Brunswick freshwaters. To what extent has this plant colonized here? And to start off the story, I'm gonna take you back to 2015 and talk about our original discovery. So what you're looking at here is a map of the Fredericton region. Um, on the left, uh, where the, the river perpendicularly comes out uh, from what is uh, to the further left, and my pointer isn't showing up for some reason, sorry, uh, that's the Mactaquac hydrogeneration station on the left. That curb on the, the right hand side of the map. Hey, that your pointer is there. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Your pointer is there. It's in black. 
It's not showing up on mine. Okay. That's I'm, strange. I, I can't <laughs> control your pointer for you. Sorry, then. That's okay, Ben. That's okay. Thanks for the heads up. So I just, I until the antivirus pops up, I can't see my pointer, so I don't know what I'm pointing at. So I'll try not to use right. it. Um, that must have been distracting when I was looking for it earlier. Um, yeah, strange that we're this far into doing everything from home and still running into technical issues. There we go. I'll have a pointer back now. Okay, so this bullseye here. This is the downtown Fredericton area here. This bullseye on the, the no, this is the north side of Fredericton. This is where I very uh, first discovered Eurasian water milfoil, and it was an odd plant. So in this region here, I have uh, about 170, 180 survey sites along the river. So I had done all of those sites, and only at one site was Eurasian water milfoil discovered. Then following that, I said, well, we must have missed it. What are the chances of an invasive species only being at one site in this re region? There must be more close by. So I did a more in intense survey boating along the shorelines. And at that time, I then discovered six populations of this plant, very small, just a few plants. That was 2015. So that's when we very first publish this. Now, I don't want to mislead. I don't think this was the actual first introduction of this plant. I think this is when we first found it. Because the next year, I got called up to a report in Nakawick, and I found that Eurasian water milfoil was much more well established in the Nakawick region. Just no one had realized it. And then once we started talking about this plant, people realized what it was. And um, so I think that it was probably established in Nakawick before we ended up finding in Fredericton. Nonetheless, just for comparison, here's our first discovery of the plant in 2015. Now let's jump ahead. Here we are at 2021. So in 2015, we were asking, oh, where is this in this region? And now we're asking, where isn't it? So just because there are blanks here in the survey zone doesn't mean that it's necess not necessarily there. This type of survey was done um, as my crews were out on the river doing other work, so whatever region they happened to be in, and recorded it if they saw it. Uh, and some of these regions are really shallow and hard to boat to, so when these surveys were happening, they, we couldn't necessarily access those sites. But more of this story is it's pretty much continuous in this region, and it's also up above the dam. So that is where it is in the, the Fredericton region alone. So when I did this initial survey in 2015, I boated all of these shorelines, and I can confirm this was the extent of the plant in 2015. And in 2021, it's pretty much continuous. So that's a uh, five, six year time frame. And it has, it is, yeah, solid. It's very dense patches. It's out competing things like Potamogeton and Velocinaria, if you're familiar with uh, aquatic plants, which tend to be the predominant beds uh, in the, in the Wollstock. So now let's look at it at the provincial level. So we've got it up uh, by Woodstock and the Meduxnikeg, and I've got it in the Washtomoic as of this summer. So we'd surveyed the Washtomoic uh, every year since 2018 and hadn't found it until this summer. We found it in Bilal Bay at one location in 2020, though I hadn't surveyed that uh, as extensively. In uh, the Kennebec cases, we found it at two sites in 2018. And this year we did a, a quick survey and found that it is extensively colonized in the cannabis cases as well. I have unconfirmed reports from Grand Lake. While people have said they have seen it there, uh, my team has not been able to receive a picture or a specimen to identify, uh, nor have we seen it when we were working in that. And I did survey Grand Lake Meadows. Uh, I had a team out that did 65 different uh, aquatic flora sites and it wasn't found in Grand Lake Meadows at that point. So maybe it hasn't gone up in here yet, but given what's happening in the other tributaries, uh, wouldn't be surprised. So this year we'll probably head up uh, north uh, a bit more and see just how far th this plant goes up. But so far it's confined to the Woolstook River and tributaries. Uh, there was a report in the year 2000 of it being uh, in a lake in Fundy. Um, and then there was a report I, I've heard just by word of mouth that it's in a reservoir, drinking water reservoir up in northern New Brunswick where they actually have to like manage the intake pipes because the plant clogs the pipes quite a bit. 
So that's where we're at. Um, unfortunately, this plant is extensively colonized in, in this region. And here's a couple of examples of, of hot spots. Um, high traffic sites are my predominant concern because these are things like boat launches uh, where people frequently visit and taking boats in and out of the water. Uh, the worst case scenario is right now that this starts jumping to other water bodies. And on the left is the Nakawik boat launch. On the right is the Maxaquac marina. And you can't navigate these two areas uh, without encountering Eurasian water milfoil at this point. So now what? We've got an invasive species extensively colonized. What can we do? So we start looking at what other places are doing. And I guess it depends on what the end goal is. No matter what we do, there's only ever been one case of eradication. And that's uh, from a small quarry in Maine. I believe they had 15 or so plants and they used a couple different management um, approaches and it wasn't extensively colonized. They had caught it uh, fairly soon and that was about seven years ago. So they're confident that it won't come back. You do have to be careful when you're looking at reports of management online when they say it's been eradicated. Sometimes that's just based on one year's worth of work and it can take several years for it to repop up and establish again. So it may not be that it's gone, it's that it's knocked back for a while it's managed, but it's not eradicated. So here's an overview of the different approaches places are, are using for this. Uh, perhaps the most common one, because it's somewhat less invasive or, or risky than the other ones, is the physical manual removal. So there are devices like the underwater lawnmower, as I call them, here on, on the left. So this would be a lake that's managed for recreational uh, purposes where this is essentially mowed down and depending uh, on the the settings for this it, it's usually depending on how much substrate you're disturbing and tearing up I think this lasts about three weeks from uh, what I, I've talked to but some places may, may only do it twice a summer depending on how much resources they have or how intensely it can be managed so all the fragments then that come off from these mowing devices have to be removed from the water because that plant debris that would break down in the water would compromise the water quality and as well it would just create more fragments for colonization. And when plants are not as thick as this and it's an early introduction, physical removal by, by diving is one of the best methods because the divers can actually reach into the substrate and get out uh, as much of the root mass as possible. It is messy work, it's hard work, you're diving and uh, in, in many New Brunswick water courses, if you, you swim and disturb the substrate, you know, you wouldn't be able to see any other plants as soon as you picked one out because we've got these really clay uh, rich substrates that would make the water pretty murky. But uh, that is an option and these are often uh, combined with other different methods for management as well. Another option is growth blocking mats. These can either be at the surface like shown on the left or uh, benthic mats so on the, the bottom as uh, on the right here. Obviously uh, with something extensive as our colonization, this is challenging because this is more of a, a spot control. So if you've got water intake that you need to protect um, or a, a small area recreationally used, um, these benthic mats have to be in place for about two months and it does come with other impacts. So you do anything that is a juvenile or larval stage that is uh, living in that substrate uh, would uh, suffer. I also caution, given what I've seen and I'm learning about cyanobacteria, is as soon as you create that um, anoxic environment, you're changing that redox chemistry of the substrate. And it could potentially give rise to other issues. Also a challenge in our region, it's, it's a river. I, I don't know if any of you have seen the flows in, in the Fredericton region, but you wouldn't be able to put uh, a mat down. And obviously any of this type of activity needs the proper permitting licenses like Wawa and I believe license of occupation because a mat would be actually attached to the, the substrate. But uh, these are uh, again, not 100% effective. They knock it back for a while and then they do come, come to, uh, back again. But 
they, they can be used to temporarily effectively knock it back um, for a, at least a bit, but they also have to be used with caution because you don't want to interfere with things like spawning grounds and um, interfere with habitat use of other species. So yeah, there's a lot con to consider no matter what method you use. Also, there's biocontrol. So there are different insects that have been used. Um, one of them is, is this weevil, and it, this is actually what keeps Eurasian water milfoil in check in its native range. There's a weevil that feeds on the tip of the plants, and it makes the plant um, like spongy porous, and it takes on water and actually falls to the bottom where it can't uh, compete for light as much. So there are groups trying to train the, these bugs to just feed on Eurasian water milfoil, um, but they do feed on other species of milfoil as well, and the population, if you introduce uh, something like a weevil, it takes time to establish, but even then uh, there's studies showing that uh, fish that feed on insects just tend to go along and pick off the weevils. So the weevil population suffers because then they become fish snacks. And this one uh, I'm a little skeptical of because humans don't have the best reputation for introducing one species to control another species. So that's biocontrol. Uh, herbicides in some places are popular because um, it's, I guess, less intense as physically man managing the plant, but they do tend to have a wider range of side effects. They tend to be a bit higher risk with um, more uncertainty for how effective they are. Talking to the EPA in Maine where they've applied herbicides on uh, a pond and a quarry five kilometers down the road, the same herbicide, the same plant, what's happened is the different water chemistries interact with the herbicide differently. So it's got different uh, effectiveness. In one area it may be effective, in another it may not. Also herbicides, even if they're not toxic alone, may react with the chemistry of the water to then become toxic to other species. And then they don't discriminate against Eurasian water milfoil. They uh, tend to attack all plants. And uh, we can have lots of discussions uh, about herbicides. Uh, there are, there's a lot to consider with these contact time flow if you're in a river environment, but it is something that some places do for management uh, recreationally uh, of these water bodies. Um, also restricting activity, this works great if you've got an early uh, introduction at a boat launch uh, where you simply close down the area. So this would be good in our province if we had an early introduction that we identified quickly uh, at a new lake at a boat launch. You simply close it until you can get divers in and, and remove as much of the milfoil as possible. Obviously on a 673 kilometer long river, uh, this isn't uh, necessarily effective, but the best thing that you can do in an early introduction is to stop people from encountering the plant and contributing to its spread. And our best option right now in the province uh, is clean drain dry. Uh, the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council has been working very hard over the past few years to get this message out because this approach works not only for Eurasian water milfoil, but for all other aquatic hitchhikers as well. In some provinces, you can actually be fine if you're caught driving down the road uh, like this with uh, plant material on your boat because it is uh, such a risk to our waters and it's the best way to manage an invasive species is to prevent new introductions because like i said most management initiatives they very rarely end in eradication so management is usually a longer term commitment and for recreation purposes more so than ecosystem management purposes so with that i just want to thank my team and to all of our partners that have helped uh, with eurasian water milfoil work and data collection over the past five years. I'm really grateful for all the support we've received in the province and I love hearing uh, about things like this watershed group where you've gotten some AIS funding to take on your own Eurasian water milfoil project because we certainly have our work cut out for us. So I look forward to those opportunities, Ben, uh, that you mentioned for uh, engaging in the field and working together. So with that, uh, I will conclude my presentation and I welcome any questions that you may have. So I have just allowed for the mic. So if you guys do have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section to the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you.
Are there any property owners here that have Eurasian water mill soil on their property? Ricky does. <coughs> have there been any studies on uh, the effects of fish diversity? Uh, no, we're not there yet. Uh, there may actually be a chance that for juvenile stages that this actually creates more protected sheltered environment. Maybe the Eurasian water milfoil, something I would like to study is does Eurasian water milfoil provide the similar habitats that our native milfoils do? And there's a good chance that they do. The difference is that when Eurasian water milfoil colonizes a, a wider area, then it's changing the other habitats that we want to build. So it's knocking off the ratio of, of types of aquatic habitats. So when we think of this, I want you to think of things like the rainforest and the boreal forest, things that are both made of plants and they're both made of trees. But yet those ecosystems, the rainforest ecosystem and the northern boreal forest are very different ecosystems. We tend to think of ecosystems below the water as plant habitat, not plant habitat. We tend to generalize a lot more. But those diversity studies coming up will be really important to help us understand that. I can say that uh, what we've observed in the head pond area of the Wollstook is that things like largemouth bass, which is another invasive species, tend to be thriving in the Eurasian water milfoil habitat. So it's a case of one invasive species thriving um, in the habitat that another presents. There are some lakes where fish kills have happened because of water quality changes when Eurasian water milfoil reaches uh, a really high density and oxygen levels uh, deplete. So uh, that just in terms of the fish population would be a detrimental effect. Now in flowing river environments, we don't see that like you would in a lake because with, with flowing environments, you tend to get oxygenated waters. But that doesn't mean that in high densities and things like coves on that river where water starts moving slower, that that could potentially become an issue. Just just on that, uh, Megan, a little bit, we do have that one of the things that Laura's working on is doing basically right now just a, re a view of a lot of document, a lot of literature to try to find out what we can as far as how Eurasian water milfoil affects fish habitat because we are concerned that it's going to change the dynamics of our fish population. Some It's going to favor some species while, you know, harboring or creating uh, challenges for other species. And similar to your comment about the large milk bass and small milk bass, which we have in our system, we do feel that it's going to favor those species over our trout and, and our native trout and salmon populations. Yeah. But so to things, this point, it's been hard to find a, a good solid answer so far on that. And so what might have to happen is we may have to go out and actually start to do some of that research on our own. And we'll be partnering with UMB and the Canadian Rivers Institute, probably Meg, to. To, to get that information and get, to get that data. Yeah, a good way to start that would be pick your species of interest, see what they normally need in a habitat, and then see what is in a Eurasian water milfoil habitat versus their habitat, and then does Eurasian wa water milfoil have potential to colonize and threaten those habitats? Um, yeah, there are certain things, or even certain stages. We all have to think of it in the terms of the life history and the life cycle, because um, just picture your picture yourself. I personify animals all the time, and I also put myself in the eyes of animals. When you're thinking of what it's like to be a small fish going through a really dense plant forest, that's not a big deal. But if you're something like a a sturgeon, I, you're not gonna do that. Um, so how these uh, animals use their habitats changes with what life stage they're they're in. Right. And so you mentioned a sturgeon, and that is a species right now that our project is going to focus on because, again, we have the short nose and Atlantic sturgeon in the Kennebec cases, and they're, they're endangered, right? So we, there's a bit of a priority to, to look after that habitat and to see what implications uh, or what, what harm it might come to them due to the... Because we do have large mats of Eurasian water milfoil that are now... Right, they're right in that area called Sturgeon Alley within the Kennebec cases, and that was really w one of the reasons why we were successful in getting the money to undertake this project. Okay, that's a high traffic area too, so I'm not. Right, it's the boat not traffic. Surprised. 
Yeah, last I was there, it wasn't in Sturgeon Alley, but I'm not surprised that it is there there now. Um, yeah, th they're interesting questions, and I think it's good to look at it specifically for the species of interest in your region. Uh, I mean, when we talk about invasive species, we generalize the effects, saying uh, like competing with native species changes in habitats. And I don't really think that your region water milfoil is any different than other invasive species in that region. And But right now, it is um, conceptual based on what we know of other invasive species, so it is an important question to look at. It'll be a challenging one to look at, but we'll find ways. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation tonight, Megan. I learned a lot, I'm sure everyone else did too, and we're so glad you were able to attend. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, and I look forward to hearing the next talks. So thank you very much. Awesome, thanks. So Lucas is up next, and he'll be talking about Hemlock Willia Delgid, which is a species not yet in New Brunswick. So it'll be nice to hear from him and have the presentation regarding this. So you can share your screen whenever and gather the audience. Okay, thank you very much. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Lucas Roscoe. Uh, I'm a research scientist with the Canadian uh, Forest Service at the Atlantic Forestry Centre in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And this evening, I'm going to give a brief presentation on a, uh, not exactly an aquatic invasive species, but one that could have major influences on aquatic environments in Atlantic Canada and New Brunswick. Uh, the title of my talk is Hemlock Willia Delgid and the First Steps in a Potential Long-Term Strategy in Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada. So the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, otherwise known as adelgi suge, uh, it's a defoliating pest of hemlock trees uh, as well as spruce trees in the native ranges. Uh, I'll be getting to that in a little bit. Um, but this is a major pest of uh, hemlocks in uh, eastern North America, specifically Carolina hemlocks, which of course are a southern species of hemlock, and uh, uh, eastern hemlock, which we find in Atlanta, Canada. Uh, Unfortunately uh, for the bug hunters out there, this is not a very easy insect to find in that it's very small, less than one to two millimeters. Um, and they tend to feed on the needles of hemlock trees. Uh, now the name hemlock woolly adelgid is derived from these white woolly ovisacs uh, that can be found in the middle picture here. These ovisacs contain the insect itself and her eggs uh, while she's developing on the needles. And when the insect and the egg eggs themselves get larger, the oversack gets larger, and we're able to identify which trees have uh, HWA on them based on this primarily. So the native range of the hemlock woolly adelgid includes generally two regions uh, on the globe. Uh, the first region is uh, the Far East, so specifically China, uh, Japan, and, and places like uh, Taiwan, etc. Uh, and the, the other native range is actually Western North America, so places like British Columbia, uh, Washington State and Oregon. Now, the invasive range of this insect uh, includes, as I said, uh, eastern North America. So it was first discovered uh, in Virginia in the 1940s. And as you can see from this map, it spread to a range that includes a number of states and two areas in Canada. I should also add that the green part of this map represents the range of hemlock uh, in this part of North America. So it was initially discovered in Virginia in 1951. Uh, and as you can see from that, and as I indicated, it spread to quite a number of states uh, in eastern in the eastern United States. Uh, in eastern Canada, it was found in the Niagara Glen Nature Reserve in 2013-15 and uh, regions of the greater Toronto area uh, around this time as well. Uh, in both situations, the uh, insect was eradicated, specifically the one in the GTA. However, it was found again in the Niagara region uh, a couple years ago, uh, and a population does exist in the Niagara region and in a place called Wayne Fleet, which is also the Niagara Peninsula. In 2017, HWA was discovered in Nova Scotia uh, in a range that encompasses five counties. Uh, you can see the uh, range here includes the southern, or I guess you could say the uh, southwestern counties of Nova Scotia uh, and the area specifically, including places like Digby, Yarmouth and Weymouth. Surveys outside of this area were negative for HWA, as well as surveys conducted in New Brunswick uh, for HWA. So HWA has not yet been found in New Brunswick. 
So I'm just going to go over some of the particulars of the biology of this insect. That'll give us kind of a good idea of what we're dealing with here. So most insects have uh, basically uh, a one generation per year life cycle where they have, they emerge in the spring, they develop adults, they lay eggs, the eggs go dormant, and then they emerge again in the following, uh, following spring. HWA is kind of different in that it actually has two generations per year. So in the spring, we have a stage called the progredient stage. Uh, this stage uh, includes something called a crawler. So this is the actually one of the only mobile aspects of the insect. The insect is probably 90% immobile. Once it lands on that needle, it does not move. It sticks itself to the needle and starts producing eggs. However, the crawler stage that comes out of the eggs uh, is active and will look for hemlock needles where it can find them. So after they've located a needle to land on, uh, they'll attach themselves to that needle, develop a white ovisac, and begin lay laying eggs within that ovisac. Uh, later in the spring, so probably late spring, early summer, uh, this progredient generation develops two different morphs, uh, a nether uh, crawler kind of insect, and also a winged insect, which actually looks like a small winged aphid. In the native range, these winged insects will lo go locate spruce trees, However, in North America, this has not been found to be the case. So basically, we only have the crawlers here. So in the summer, uh, this is the cystens generation now. So the eggs from the breeding generation uh, become the cystens. The cystens again have a crawler stage. These again settle on needles. Uh, they have kind of a longer cycle where they actually remain on the needle before they actually begin their development into an adult. This adult produces eggs throughout the winter. And then that gives rise to the following progredient generation in the following spring. So a bit complex, but uh, pretty straightforward. So as I indicated, uh, in the native ranges, these tend to have kind of a, a two-year life cycle. Uh, but here you can see we have the two generations per year. And this wing form called a sexupere colonizes spruce in places like Japan. Uh, when they go and they colonize spruce, they actually continue this life cycle with the crawlers, et cetera on spruce. However, we've not been able to find that occurring anywhere in, in eastern North America. Another interesting thing about HWA is that in the native ranges, uh, we have both males and we have females. However, in, in eastern North America, HWA is, is something that we call parthenogenic. So parthenogenic means that it only has females. So the females can actually lay eggs without having to have their eggs fertilized which works out very well for the HWA. She doesn't have to try and find a mate. But in terms of uh, our point of view, in terms of managing the spread, this is a kind of a negative thing because conceivably one or a few HWA females could start a population on their own without having to find males. So the main reason why we're worried about HWA in Atlantic Canada is because of its potential effects on Eastern hemlock. So. Eastern hemlock is a, a very important uh, shade tolerant species, primarily found in aquatic areas. Uh, in these areas, it is often the dominant canopy species uh, for these really sensitive regions. Because of this, it has very ecologically significant. Uh, these regions are very specialized, not just in terms of the fact that there's things like temperature regulation and that kind of thing with the water, but because they're so specialized, they have very unique biomes, habitats, and biodiversity that are not replicated anywhere else. So the way HWA affects uh, hemlock trees is through the following. So as I indicated, the mobile uh, aspect of the HWA life cycle is something called a crawler. So the crawler will plant itself on the base of the needle attached to the basically the twig. It has a long, basically proboscis that we call a stylet which is actually many times the length of the insect itself, that it inserts into the needle and it's through this stylet that it absorbs nutrients uh, and its own nutrition from the needles from the hemlock. So feeding from the HWA crawlers causes discoloration and eventual defoliation of branch tips. Now, unfortunately, HWA is quite a serious pest of hemlock, uh, particularly in areas where it's not managed. Uh, HWA infestations can be fatal to all hemlock trees, regardless of age and regardless of health in, uh, in up to uh, 15 years, so four to 15 years. And stands that are affected by HWA can sustain up to 95% mortality if HWA is not managed. Now, why is this the case? Why is HWA such a problem? Well, this comes down to 
discussing how the population of HWA is regulated within the environment. So a major impact on HWA uh, mortality, so that's basically how many HWA don't survive, is uh, winter mortality. So it's been observed that 90 to 95% mortality can occur when temperatures reach minus 24, approximately minus 24 degrees Celsius. However, in the Northeastern United States, where a lot of the research has been done for some 25 years now, uh, there has been evidence of cold tolerance in the populations as well as populations rebounding anyways in the following year. Another important regulator for all populations is the presence of a natural enemy complex. So those predators that will maintain uh, an insect or a species density below a threshold that we deem ecologically or economically important. So such a natural enemy complex exists in places like Japan and Western North America. And because of this complex, HWA is not a serious pest. If it ever gets up to high enough numbers, the, the, the predators and the natural enemies will regulate the population back down. However, in Eastern North America, because HWA is non-native, there is no natural enemy complex, and that allows HWA to get up to the numbers that result in things like 95% mortality in affected stands. Now, there are predators that will attack uh, HWA in certain situations, so things like ladybugs, um, but they're kind of a generalist predator and they'll only attack HWA basically when there's nothing else to eat. Another important component of the natural enemy complex are things like fungal pathogens and bacteria. And while these occur in the native range for HWA, they're not really present in Eastern North America. So when HWA was first discovered, uh, myself and several other scientists with the Canadian Forest Service were tasked with kind of figuring out, okay, how serious is HWA and how can we actually potentially manage this pest? So the project that I've been working on for the last three years is developing kind of an idea of what kind of natural enemy complex exists for HWA in Nova Scotia, what kind of effects it's having, and whether or not this might be an opportunity for something like imported biological control agents to actually manage HWA. So the first task that we wanted to do was actually ascertain if a natural enemy complex uh, exists in Nova Scotia. So you can see on this map right here, uh, all the red dots represent positive areas for HWA. Uh, and I conducted my studies within this, uh, basically this pink area all over the place. So what we wanted to look at was the, the composition of a natural enemy complex and what kind of effect it's actually having. And this was done through a variety of different means. So basically any kind of way you can look for insects, that's how we were looking for them. So this includes trapping them on sticky panels, uh, tasking people to basically go up to a branch and hit it with a stick and knock it onto a sheet. And then we collect all the insects that fall on the sheet. And then actually taking branches that had HWA, caging them so no potential predators could get in, and then comparing the mortality on those branches with branches that were uncaged and would allow the predators to get in and out. So uh, basically this is kind of a complex graph, but basically what this indicates uh, or what this tells us is the kind of the results of our caged so the, the branches that didn't have any HWA predators with uncaged where they did potentially have predators. This gives us an idea of the mortality that we were actually seeing. So if there was an effect of a natural enemy complex in Nova Scotia, we would see all the blocks that have a U underneath them. So that means uncaged. The mortality would be a lot lower than it would be for cage. So the cage mortality would be, would be different. You can see here that basically it's flatlined across. So therefore, because there's no difference between these, that means there's really no uh, natural enemy complex that's affecting HWA, which is kind of what we expected to see, but we wanted to confirm it. So this brings us kind of to our next step, which is investigating integrated pest management for HWA. So clearly HWA is a threat to hemlock, uh, not just in Nova Scotia, but potentially elsewhere. And it's up to people like myself and other uh, other people working on this to develop ways of potentially managing HWA uh, if people want that. So the first step is kind of deals with things like insecticides. So in the United States, they've identified several different bioinsecticides that can be either applied to uh, hemlock trees themselves or they can actually inject it into the soil. Uh, I should add too that uh, a lot of work has been gone has gone into determining you know non-target effects, 
persistence in the environment and everything that's kind of been identified for use against HWA has gone through a very rigorous process in terms of uh, seeing if it's safe for the environment besides whether or not it's actually effective against HWA. So if I say insecticides, don't get scared. Uh, it's just kind of a general term for what we're working with here. So one of the, the, the nice things about this is it does provide uh, immediate effect on HWA with very minimal, if any, non-target effects. However, the effects of these insecticides are often short term. They only go up to about seven years protection, uh, if that, and then you have to do it again. And of course, if you have many hundreds of hemlock trees on your property, for example, there's a significant monetary cost as well as time cost with applying these insecticides within the environment. However, in terms of integrated pest management, that means kind of the, the integration of two different methods or multiple methods in an overall pest management program. So the idea of using insecticides is to protect things like valuable trees if they're on their own, so potential things like street trees, for example. However, if we're gonna be dealing with areas with many hundreds or thousands of hemlock trees, as I indicated, it's it's pretty uh, unlikely that insecticides are going to be even monetarily worth it in terms of actually protecting your trees. Um, of course, if you had a blank check uh, for that, you could go do that. However, when it comes to actually managing a forest environment, uh, that's where something like biological control uh, can come in. And this involves the actual uh, aggregation or potential importation of specialist natural enemies from the native range into areas where they can actually provide that population regulation on HWA. And these can be either inoculative in that we can just import it once and then leave it and then the enemies take off, or they can be inundative where it's a process of repeating it multiple times a year or maybe once every year or two, that kind of thing. So, and what is needed for kind of successful biological control program? Well. Of course, it's not it's not as simple as you know taking one insect that you think works and then throwing you know a couple of them in a forest. Uh, it's not like that at all. Um, there's a lot of very important things that must be uh, assessed and confirmed before something like this happens. Not just for the fact that we want to make sure it works, but for the fact that, as was alluded to in the previous talk, we don't want to be actually causing a bigger problem than we already have. So the first and of course the main thing that we want to know is what is the target range of the insect that we're thinking of importing? And ideally, what we want to have is something that attacks just that target we're looking at. So something we call a narrow host range. So it's not just something to say like, well, it only eats HWA. Uh, it can't be a case where, you know, it eats HWA, but can also develop on these other insects. We don't want that kind of thing. Another important thing, and this kind of deals to the effectiveness of the program, is something called synchronization. So this is kind of the, the ensuring that, so the feeding part of the enemy actually occurs in the environment at the same time during the season that its food is actually there. So let's say that we had a beetle and it's a predator, but it only eats the eggs of the target we're looking at. Syn proper synchronization would mean that it emerges or is released in the environment when those eggs are present. It could be released when maybe the larvae are present or when the pest adults are present, but we would probably get little to no effect on the population because that's just not the food type that the enemy is actually looking for. So synchronization is essential. And if you don't have that, the effectiveness of the program is gonna be minimal. And finally, of course, we have to make sure that the insects that we're actually potentially importing can survive in these conditions. So we don't want a case where, well, we have an insect that has a very narrow host range, which is great. It's well synchronized, but it can't take temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius because clearly uh, maybe outside of today, because uh, we had such nice weather, um, it's going to have a problem in terms of uh, actually attacking and damaging e or damaging the pest itself. So. These are the three critical things we have to keep in mind when we're kind of thinking about a program like this. So one of the benefits, uh, I guess we can say in terms of HWA research uh, for us Canadian researchers is that we have a lot of um, you know, collaborators and teammates who have been working on HWA in the United States uh, for about 30 years now. Uh, so in the United States, they've decided that biological control has been has been and is the primary method of managing HWA 
in that country. And they've gone full steam ahead in terms of investigating it and implementing it uh, on the ground. So the program in the United States was initiated in, in 1992. Uh, this began with surveys that actually went to places like Japan and China to identify natural enemies that could be useful in the United States. So I know these are some big Latin names, but uh, that we're going to have to deal with it, unfortunately. But one of the insects that they actually uh, investigated was something called Sassagiscimnus sugae, which is a member of the coccinellid family. Now, coccinellids, everyone are familiar with, are actually ladybugs. So this is a type of ladybug. These were identified from Japan uh, in the 1990s. Uh, they were evaluated for things like synchronization, host range, and environmental suitability. Uh, they were imported in the United States, mass reared, so several million insects were actually reared, and they were released in about 16 different states in the United States. Now, unfortunately, given the uh, output for this program in terms of the insects they were releasing, they got relatively mixed results. So what they were discovering was that while the insect had a very narrow host range and that they could rear it in the lab and that, you know, it synchronized well with uh, HWA, they found that the insect itself was quite sensitive to environmental conditions, particularly in areas that were cold. So some of the more northern states with HWA, so places like Maryland, Connecticut, Massachusetts. However, they did find that the insect itself did establish in some of the more temperate areas, so places like Tennessee and Virginia. Another insect that is, has shown promise for a program like this is something called Laracobius nigrinus. So this is a derodontid beetle. Uh, it has a fancy name called tooth neck fungus beetle. So most of the insects in this family actually feed on fungus and they're actually very small, but this one itself is actually a predator. These are found in Western North America. So specifically British Columbia, for example, that's where their original range is. And these are an important predator on HWA in British Columbia. One of the reasons it's very uh, effective uh, against HWA in British Columbia is it's well synchronized. So it feeds on the nymphs through the winter and then the larvae themselves are actually predaceous. So the larvae of the beetle and they'll feed on the eggs. Another important thing is that these insects are highly specialized. They can only complete development on HWA. So that means that uh, as the insects developing, the larvae, the eggs, uh, and then the adults themselves, they can only go all the way through to the adults on HWA themselves. Uh, they may feed a little bit on something like balsam woolly adelgid, which is actually a pest itself, but they can't complete development on them. Now, an important component in terms of understanding things like host range and that kind of thing is how do these things actually integrate with other native species that are very similar? So Laracobius, the genus Laracobius, there are actually species, specifically uh, Laracobius rubidus, which is native to uh, Eastern North America. And there is the potential for things like hybridization between the two species. However, this has been observed to be, you know, while it's there, it's at a very, very low rate and does not really affect uh, Laracobius rubidus populations. However, again, that's something that has to be taken into account when developing a program like this. So this is kind of a bit different from the coleoptera. So the beetles, this is a, an actual fly species. Now, this isn't exactly your typical house fly or black fly even, even though it's about the size of a black fly. This species uh, from the Camimyid family, so the midge family, uh, includes two species, uh, Leucotaraxis argenticolis and Leucotaraxis pinnaperta. Now, the fly adult itself is harmless. It doesn't, it doesn't really act as a predator. They'll feed on nectar, they'll drink water, that kind of thing. But it's the larvae themselves that are actually the predators. So the, the, the maggots, the fly maggot larvae, they're actually the predators that will go after the eggs on HWA. The nice thing about this is it has two generations per year. And very good, these are both synchronized with the occurrence of HWA eggs. So both cystin eggs and progredient eggs. So these are native to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and releases of this insect actually have been occurring uh, in New York State based out of places like Ithaca. And they've been trying to integrate this with uh, some of the other species to kind of get that multiple uh, effect populations on HWA. So as I've been saying uh, so far in this presentation, synchronization is critical for uh, the effectiveness of a biological control program. So as I indicated, the uh, Leucotaraxis species 
they synchronize very well with the egg stage. So that's the target host stage that they're looking at for HWA. Now, one of the benefits of a biological control program is that you don't just have to use one species, you can use multiple species. And it seems that the idea that's being you know, postulated in the United States through a number of researchers who've been working on HWA for a long time is that a combination of the Leucotaraxis species with the Laracobia species, which feeds on the nymphs, as you can see here, is our best bet for actually managing HWA. And it makes sense if we have a pest, uh, we kind of want to hammer that population as much as possible, not just, you know, affect it at one part of the life cycle, try and affect it at every part of the life cycle to get that mortality up. So this is kind of the plan that uh, myself and some of my uh, collaborators have been working on for the last couple of years. So the first plan was to determine if biological control is necessary. Uh, our study showed that there really, there was no effect of a natural enemy complex on HWA. So in our cage studies, there was no difference in terms of mortality. So basically those that were exposed to predators, uh, their mortality was exactly the same as those who were not exposed to predators. Uh, we've identified two candidates that could be useful for this. So the Leucotaraxis group uh, and the Laracobius uh, nigrinus. Uh, they seem to be good candidates based on the literature. So um, things like synchronization, environmental suitability, they seem to be pretty good for what we're potentially looking at here. Uh, we've done some evaluations of their suitability as candidates. So again, not just the synchronization environmental and environmental conditions, but the host range is very important. And the research that's been done on the host range, which we're gonna to repeat to an extent, uh, really indicates that both species are very specific on HWA. We're not gonna get a lot of problems in terms of them attacking other insects, thankfully. And then finally, uh, and this is kind of where we're at now, we're, we're looking at potential field experiments in Nova Scotia for the survival of these insects to kind of confirm their environmental suitability for the areas and then perhaps small scale studies on actually measuring what their effect on HWA is. And then of course, the final thing is that we actually have to figure out a way of producing enough insects for such a program. Uh, currently our idea for doing this is actually going out to Western Canada and sourcing them ourselves. But if we're gonna have a major uh, management program, we're gonna have to figure out a way to actually uh, start rearing them in the lab using field populations. So I'm gonna wrap up my presentation with just some final thoughts and then some recommendations for everyone on the call here. Um, a biological control does have, unfortunately, not a great reputation. Everyone hears about the horror stories with this, but it actually does have a very, uh, very extensive knowledge base and there are many success stories with it. And often in many situations, it's the only possible management strategy for something like HWA. Uh, and consequently, we're investigating it as a long-term management option for HWA. Uh, as I indicated, um, population regulation by natural enemies is critical for maintaining populations so they don't become a pest. What we've observed in our studies is that there's little to no effect of natural enemies in Nova Scotia, and this is consistent with research done in the United States. And we've identified the potential candidates, again, based on the United States research. Uh, and I've discussed these species and why I think these are going to be potentially useful. So finally, uh, just some tips for landowners. Uh, there are uh, directions outlined by CFIA for things like the movement of hemlock goods. Uh, none of them exist in New Brunswick at the time, which is good. Um, but if you're ever in places like Digby, Yarmouth, any of those counties, uh, just and you're going to potentially be moving HWA. There are guidelines that have been put out by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, indicating the movement of things like hemlock stock, uh, hemlock seedlings, that kind of thing. And it's important to kind of just check with CFIA and make sure you're not going to be potentially moving uh, contaminated wood from one area to another. It's always good that if you have hemlocks on your property, always just to kind of keep an eye on them. Uh, the insect form that you'd be looking for is in this picture right here, these little woolly sacks. Uh, there are other insects that produce similar sacks, so sometimes spiders can produce little white sacks. Um, but it's important just to keep an eye on your trees. And uh, this is especially important in areas that are kind of wind exposed, so places kind of on the edge of a river, on the edge of a lake, on a waterfront. 
these are areas where HWA could potentially land first because HWA does move in the wind occasionally. And as with any kind of, uh, you know, invasive species in general, uh, and again, as alluded to in the previous presentation, try to avoid moving material from that's contaminated from one area to another. Uh, many of these species that uh, become invasive species and become a problem are unfortunately moved through human mediated movement. So things like emerald ash borer, for example, gypsy moth back in the day, uh, these were all basically their ranges spread because people were moving things like firewood, bark, et cetera. HWA is no exception to this. So it's important just to kind of, you know, if you take it from one area, just burn it in that area, or if you go camping, try to use wood that's provided at the park itself. So that's the conclusion of my presentation, and I'd be very happy uh, to take questions. And I should just add too that if you do have any other uh, questions or if you think you have HWA, uh, you can contact myself. Again, my name is Lucas Roscoe. I work at the Atlantic Forestry Center uh, for the Canadian Forest Service. Or you can uh, contact the Canadian Food Inspection Agency at any one of the offices in Atlantic Canada, and they'd be happy to follow up with you. So again, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Lucas. That was amazing and very informative. And it looks like Megan has a question. Hi, yeah, thanks, Lucas. In about half an hour, I have walked away with a bit of a different perspective on biocontrol because you're right, we always do hear uh the the failure examples of course uh, so I, I really appreciated that part of your presentation that was very enlightening um i also wanted to just add a little story in that in 2007 i worked for cfia as a summer student and we were doing uh surveys for hba so we've been watching for it for a while yeah and uh, me and another girl thought we had found it and upon closer inspection under the microscope we found a newspaper that was shredded up so finely on hemlocks because there was little letters as we teased apart the white fibers. Um, which so this brought back memories too. Uh, and maybe I missed this and I apologize if I did. My phone was ringing. Is there a rate of spread that has been monitored along the eastern seaboard? I know you showed the map and the expansion. Is there a rate and a range that has been calculated? So, um, like so many miles per year kilometers per year yeah so, so such a range has been uh has been discovered and it's about uh i want to say about 10 to 12 miles per year um now that's kind of hwa just kind of moving around on its own so hwa is, is quite i guess you can say nefarious it can move through a different a lot of different ways it can be picked up in the wind it can be blown with twigs uh and the theory about how it got to Nova Scotia is that it was actually on birds that migrated from Maine up into Nova Scotia, landed on hemlock trees, and that's how it got here. Uh, so there is average, but any of those factors I brought up could actually spread HWA way beyond, you know, 12 miles. Yeah, those could be bigger jumps for sure. The no. bird thing I find curious, because I've also heard that about Eurasian modern milfoil, but I've never seen ducks flying through the air with chunks of vegetation on them. But HWA is much smaller. So have there yes. actually been um, observations of this on birds? Yes, there has. Okay. So, I mean, I don't have specific studies in my head, but that is one of the methods that has been observed for moving HWA is through birds, essentially. So. You know, in areas where HWA is actually quite prevalent, so some of those areas in Nova Scotia I was looking at, um, we had put out yellow sticky cards to say, oh, well, you know, instead of actually clipping branches and clipping twigs and, you know, looking at the branches ourselves, maybe we can actually collect them on sticky traps. And we were checking our traps and we're talking like a three by five piece of plastic. And there must have been like 10,000 HWA. And they all look like basically like, grains of pepper basically and they were coating the traps so you know they can get on things like birds and they can you know if a bird gets you know 2000 hwa on it and only like three of them survive that could be enough if they get on the right tree to start another population so that is something that you know unfortunately we can't control bird migration but just something to you know be aware of and 
you know, that's kind of why I indicated, you know, places that are kind of more exposed to the wind or the canopy tops of trees. Those are good places to look if you're going to be looking for HWA because that's where HWA is most likely going to end up. Great. Interesting talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, Ben. Hey, Lucas, thanks a bunch, man. That was, uh, I'm going to just reiterate, I, that was amazing for me because, well, I guess what was amazing is Megan's question because that's exactly where I was going because I was surprised to see that population, that isolated population in Nova Scotia after yes. hearing that you told me that they don't, the, fly, the flying females don't lay eggs. So I was saying, well, how did they get to Nova Scotia then? So yeah. to hear that they actually are able to then take flight or get on birds is and that's how they're transported is is uh an eye opener for me so yes that must mean that they can go well over you know their spread can all of a sudden be more than 12 kilometers per year yeah with that then is it worthwhile for community groups to look at a monitoring program or getting our staff more up to speed on you know um what woolly algae is and how to look for it in the in the field, I guess it would be my question. Oh, I think it's uh, it's it's one of those insects that if you are surveying for invasive insect species and you have hemlock, it's something to keep an eye out for sure. Um, now I know that, uh, like Megan was saying, she worked with the CFIA. CFIA does do a lot of uh, survey strategies, you know, throughout Atlantic Canada and everywhere, you know, but they they only have their capacity for what they can do. Um, but you know i know it's it, if if you ever wanted someone like myself or someone from cfia to come down and train you guys show you how to do it where to go i'd be happy to do that and uh i think in terms of monitoring for not just hwa but for any invasive species it's in, the most of the legwork is going to be done by you know community groups such as your own and other kind of you know private citizens and that kind of thing that's how these things are going to get found and uh you know I know there's been several occasions where things like EAB have been picked up, you know, in cities uh, by an, a landowner who just, you know, called the city one day and said, my ash tree looks sick. And it turns out it has EAB. So a lot of that work is is really done on the ground by people like yourself. And, you know, as, you know, someone who's working on this, I'd be happy to participate and help out groups like you guys. So. Well, that's great, and I'll, I'll, like I'll be honest, Lucas. Why we I hadn't prioritized the haw because it to me it wasn't a threat because it isn't here yet. But if it can spread in that manner, yes, it could be here rather quickly. So we should be starting to pay a little bit closer attention than maybe what as a com committee we thought we should have been doing in the first place. So that's a good you know that that adds a when we look at our prioritization of our efforts as a volunteer group. Yeah. maybe that knocks it up that notch that we should consider it a little bit higher so that's that's great Absolutely. information uh there's okay. a question in the chat there uh from Dwayne simpkins in nova scotia is there a restriction in moving hemlock logs so the areas that are quarantined for hwa uh i believe there's no restrictions for moving hwa within them but i believe there is there there are directions in terms of movement of logs outside of those those quarantined areas so uh, if you go on the CFIA website and you just basically look up Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, it'll tell you exactly what the rules are uh, that you'll, you may have to follow. So, Great. Laura, maybe if you can, uh, at the end of this, uh, try to post the CFIA website uh, link, and then that yeah. way people can do that on their own. Yeah. Awesome. So that looks like all the questions for tonight. Thank you again, Lucas, for that You're presentation. Welcome. So now we'll be moving along to the MBISC presentation. So I think it's, um, yeah, I was gonna say, I think it's Shelby presenting tonight, so. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Newer hires and we can hear you really well, so. Oh, perfect. Okay, and I will share my screen, hopefully. Um, present that. Oh, this is my challenge. Sorry. I'm the same as you, Megan. Even after two years of this, I'm still not good at technology. Um, perfect. And then I'm going to present it. So you're not seeing my notes, correct? Everyone can see that? Yeah, that's the correct page. Okay, perfect. 
So I will start unless anyone tells me otherwise. I know I have 20 minutes, so I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, but hi, my name is Shelby Heath. I am the project coordinator with the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. So if you haven't heard of us before tonight, uh, we're excited to hopefully you'll hear more about us. We, you know, we're excited to work with the Kennebecasis to organize this kind of open house invasive species event. So we're really excited to talk more about invasive species in New Brunswick, especially aquatic invasive species tonight and what we can do to prevent their spread. So just a brief overview about our organization. Our overall mission is to protect New Brunswick's environmental, economic, and recreational interests from the threat of invasive species. So we're not just looking at the environmental impacts. We're also noticing species that have impacts on our recreation, that have impacts on our economy, uh, a bit of a holistic view. And we do that through a couple of different ways. So we like to enable and promote collaboration. So working with partners like Cannabicasis and other watershed organizations across the province, different resource groups, you know, ACAP St. John and Eastern Charlotte Waterways, NBALA, all these great community-based organizations who are on the ground in these areas doing the work. So we can't be everywhere all across the province at once. So making sure we collaborate with these partners so that we're not reinventing the wheel. We can hopefully coordinate all of our processes and be more efficient. Uh, so with that, again, providing leadership, knowledge and expertise. So if people have questions about invasive species in the province, we hope that we can be able to answer them or at least know someone who can answer them, hopefully. Uh, and then with that, engaging, enabling and empowering people to take action on invasive species, because as I will say throughout this, and hopefully you've gotten through this, these previous presentations, humans are the main element in this invasive species problem. They're moving these invasive species, introducing them. So how can we take some action as humans? So just to give everyone a general overview of what I'm talking about when I say invasive species. So we've heard about Eurasian water milfoil, hemlock willy adelgid, examples of invasive species. But if we take that a step back, really by definition, an invasive species is non-native, so not from here. So we said Europe, Asia are typically where we see these species come from a similar climate. They spread rapidly, so they're able to reproduce really quickly, create a lot of seeds, uh, really just outnumber our species. And then thirdly, they have to have a harmful impact. So again, as I said, we're not just looking at this in the environment. We know invasive species have environmental impacts. We saw Eurasian water milfoil grows rapidly. Hemlock willy adelgid kills hemlock trees. But we're also considering, you know, human impacts. So things like giant hogweed is a very toxic plant that in itself isn't super invasive. It's not really going to have huge impacts, but has that phytotoxic sap that can cause a third degree like burn on human skin, so clearly pushes it up in the priority level. So we're looking at all three of these kind of criteria before we call something an invasive species, because people tend to uh, put a negative view on things, as we were saying, biocontrol sometimes gets a bad name. Sometimes, you know, harmful species get a bad name and they get called invasive species maybe when they're not. So here's some just examples of this, just to really push this point home. This here is uh, everyone's least favorite forest friend, uh, poison ivy. So leaves of three, let it be. This one, hopefully you are familiar with. Uh, it is actually native to uh, New Brunswick, to Canada. It's a pretty common forest understory species, but does have that harmful impact, of course, causes that itchy rash that we don't like. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, poison ivy is invasive. It's not, it is a native species. It is meant to be here. It serves a purpose in our forest ecosystems. You know, different species use it. It is an important part. So it is not considered an invasive species. Things like tomatoes, we introduce them for obviously producing a food source. Uh, they are not from here, can be introduced into a lot of areas, but are not traditionally going to escape out and cause impacts on the environment. So we don't really see tomato plants growing all over the forest taking over. So again, not what we would consider an invasive species. This one is kind of an interesting example that I like to bring up because it shows how nuanced this conversation can be. Uh, invasive species tend to, yeah, get this, it's this or it's that, but as we see with climate change, with shifting regions, shifting behaviors, 
things are on the move. Things are not staying where they're supposed to be. And with that, right, we're seeing some species come in that we've not seen before. So turkey, wild turkey is a really good example. Traditionally, it was not able to survive our cold winters in New Brunswick, was not able to establish a population. But now with climate change, with different things, we are seeing that wild turkeys are actually really successfully establishing across New Brunswick. We've recently introduced our first turkey hunting season uh, this past year. So it's really an interesting question of would we consider this an invasive species? And right now I'm gonna have to put a big question mark on it. Unfortunately, I can't always have the answers. This one is a very interesting case of it remains to be seen. Uh, they clearly were not typically native to this range, but we don't really know how they're impacting native birds. As Megan said, sometimes these studies take years and years and years to really see, you know, consistent data so that we can make a conclusion like that. So a question mark on some of these species. But then we have some really traditional examples that check all of these boxes and really, you know, confirm that they are an invasive species. So if you are not familiar with this one, uh, you will be at the end of this talk. This is zebra mussels. So not the bigger mussel, but all of these teeny ones all over the outside. So this is zebra and then we also have quagga mussels uh, are really tiny. They can populate very quickly in a water column. They're free floating as eggs. They attach onto any hard surface they can find. So whether that be a boat, a dock, anything, you left your floaty in the water too long, uh, they can attach to it. And they are really good filter feeders. So they'll filter the water as mussels do, getting all that phytoplankton, zooplankton, those really base uh, you know, members of the food web. And then the water will be very clear and beautiful, which is great for people in swimming, but not very good for productivity, not very good for water health. So these zebra mussels are kind of a very scary case of a very invasive species that I'll talk about more. And then this one is also an interesting one that I like to mention, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, again, gets this very, oh, it's scary. It has these human health impacts. It has not been traditionally seen. It is starting to appear more. So we're having some questions. Well, is cyanobacteria invasive? Is this blue-green algae invasive? And it is not, no, it is a native species of bacteria, not an algae at all. Um, so it really is naturally occurring in our water systems. But as I said, things are changing. Uh, we're getting a bit warmer summers. We're having, you know, damming of waterways. We're impacting the flow of water and things like that. So we are starting to see cyanobacteria appear more, but that doesn't make it invasive. Again, a native species that naturally occurs in our environments. So just to kind of give a general overview of some of these impacts that we do see from these invasive species, obviously we're going to see impacts on our native species. They are coming in and pushing them out, taking over their food source, taking over habitat. So we can see things like a large mouth bass or small mouth bass there eating up a native fish. Uh, the traditional invasive species uh, character we have here is the common house cat. So really tend to impact songbird populations, uh, keep your cats inside, spay and neuter your cats. Uh, and then we also have alteration of predator prey dynamics. So this photo on the right here is a great photo. I love it. It is a lionfish. So if you ever get down to Florida, which I'm hoping to soon one day after COVID, go and see these lionfish that have taken over the Florida Keys. And they're this crazy looking, they've got these wild poisonous spikes all around them. And they are introduced from lower in South America, and they obviously are able to reproduce and are very successful. These poisonous barbs make, you know, predators like a shark here not very sure what to do with these introduced aquatic invasive species. So giving these invasive species kind of an edge, they don't have as much competition as we said with hemlock willy dobson, might not have a natural predator that will limit their populations. So they're able to really uh, have large impact. They're also going to compete with the native species, as I said, push out anything that isn't able to compete. So we see garlic mustard on the bottom here, just taking over a forest understory. Obviously, no diversity, not a very healthy forest understory. It's just exclusively this one invasive species. And then finally, I like to touch on that invasive species can actually bring new diseases and introduce new diseases. So even bacteria and fungus can be invasive. So this here is called white nose syndrome on bats. So a really sad story of an introduced fungus that gets into 
uh, bat populations and it actually creates a fungus in their nose that irritates them. They wake up mid hibernation and they're not able to find food, they're not able to survive and unfortunately they die. So we're losing our bat populations very quickly. Over 90% of our bat populations have been impacted by this white nose fungus syndrome. So this was introduced, they believe, into a public cave in New York. Um, so someone who had been over in Europe or Asia had gotten that on their equipment and come into a public cave in New York, and it was able to propagate from there. So a really good lesson that I will drive home later about cleaning off our equipment before we move between places. And then clearly, there are things that we're concerned about for ourselves. As I said, we're looking at the impacts not only to the environment, but to humans. So here's some just quick examples. We have things like decreased ecosystem services. So that's just a fancy word for the things we get from the environment for free. So breathing the air we breathe, drinking the water, uh, things like wetlands preventing floods. So we can see here when we remove some of these wetlands, Fredericton is a really great example of a flood prone area. So if we had more of these kind of natural uh, environmental services, we wouldn't see as many of these impacts. Also infrastructure, zebra mussel is a very typical case of it can attach to a lot of things. People don't like that. It damages their property. Uh, human health impacts, as I said, this is giant hogweed. So again, causes this huge third degree like burn on your arm. Not fun. Have not experienced it myself. Would not like to. And then of course, impacts to recreation. Uh, being a outdoorsy based province, we love to go outside and experience nature. So having our lakes and rivers overrun by Eurasian water milfoil or having our forests not be as diverse are great with our eastern hemlocks. These are things that will really impact how we enjoy nature. And as we know, with this COVID pandemic, nature is huge for our mental and physical health. So really, we're trying to protect those recreational opportunities with nature. So the common question I always get, Shelby, stop wasting your time talking to me, get out there, go get rid of those invasive species that you're talking about. What are we doing about them? Well, this is the problem is I can't really do anything. Uh, the invasion is a bit too along this curve. So I love to bring up this image. If you start looking at invasive species, anything after this presentation, uh, you will find this curve pretty quickly. So on the left here, we have area infested, on the right, control costs, so how much it's going to cost us to eradicate, if we could ever eradicate, completely get rid of that species. And on the bottom, we have time. So when a species is first introduced, so say with Eurasian water milfoil, if we had first noticed it back in 2015 and we've had an entire provincial system in place, an early detection rapid response system, and we had, you know, task force that came in and, you know, isolated these populations and made sure, you know, that we removed every single plant, we could potentially, in a perfect world, eradicate that species. But as we all know, the world is what it is. And we get farther along this curve as we go along. So we maybe detect more. There's maybe a scientist uh, like Megan Bruce is doing great work to find this species, but we don't really have a ton of public awareness yet. There's not a huge amount of you know, motion happening. And then as we get further up this curve, as we said, the public becomes aware. We really start to see some media attention. What is this plant that's growing around my dock? That's when that species is pretty established. As we said, we might not even know the you know, expansion of this plant. It might be further up in Nakawik. We can't really know. Uh, and at that point, the eradication of that is very unlikely. Intense effort would be required. We would need a lot of time and a lot of money dedicated towards that one species just to get rid of it. And as we know, there's a lot of invasive species to manage. We have to prioritize. We have to, you know, pick out which ones are going to have the largest impact. Emerald ash borer is a great case. Obviously, we can't have ash trees falling over in our cities. We can't have, you know, people being impacted by that. So that takes priority. But we see the control costs just get very large once we get going with these kind of things. So the idea is kind of, you know, usually, whoops, resistance is futile. It's hard to manage a species once it's already here. So our big plug and our always our messaging is better to prevent invasive species from coming rather than try and manage the ones that are here, right? So we want to prevent more species being introduced. We want to prevent the next Eurasian water milfoil, the next hemlock woolly delgid 
from coming here in the first place. That's always the better option. Uh, but obviously, we make do with what we can. Uh, my position, we're starting to work more with how can we manage these species at a, you know individual property level? What can we do with you know nature trusts or watershed associations? Say you have a property with you know species at risk. What can we do to minimize the impacts of that invasive species? while understanding that we won't ever really completely get rid of it. So it's just about understanding kind of the overall scope and goal. So again, as I said, doing all of these things, very labor intensive, time consuming, costly, someone's got to pay for it. Uh, unfortunately, the environmental nonprofit is not a very lucrative business. So we have to apply for government funding every year. And yeah, it's a pretty limited pot. So trying to get the funds and resources available to do this work is the first step. So as I said, target efforts to prevent new introductions. So just a little bit about how these species are actually spread. So we've heard about all the negative impacts they can have, all the reasons we don't want them here. Um, and of course, species, as we know, will move naturally. There is migration, things floating downstream, the hemlock woolly adelgid getting attached to a bird and getting picked up, right? These things will occur in nature. But the bigger part that I would love to address tonight is the human activity, because humans love to mess around. So planting things in gardens, introducing it for a food source, right? Maybe we introduced it to get rid of another invasive species. As we said, some of these, uh, you know, worst case scenarios of biocontrol. Maybe we have unwanted pets or aquarium plants that we are trying to get rid of. Things can get caught up on our trailer. So you can see an image here, the Asian water milfoil or another plant getting caught up. So the list goes on and on. So humans love to do a lot of things, move things with our hiking boots, uh, commercial wood importing, moving firewood is huge, uh, introducing new game species, people moving turkeys around, maybe they want to hunt turkeys on their property. There's a lot of things that humans do to mess around. So I like to say that my job is not about managing the environment, it's about managing humans, because we're really the ones causing the problems, unfortunately. So again, just a bit more detailed on the aquatic side of things, because that is kind of the theme of tonight. I just wanted to highlight that we do have some historical vectors of spread. So ballast water was a huge way that aquatic invasive species were being introduced into our environment. Um, but we also have, you know, things like moving on trailers, moving on equipment, everything like that. So I would really just wanted to highlight some species that I would want people to be on the lookout for when it comes to New Brunswick aquatic invasive species, ones that we are trying to get people aware of that maybe you can't see right now, but might be on their way soon. So this one is zebra and quagga mussels. Again, they're two separate species, but very similar looking, much, much smaller than our native mussels. They were first identified in Lake St. Clair in 1986, and they have now spread far throughout Ontario, through all of the Great Lakes but not in New Brunswick at the moment. So as we can see this map, it's not good news, but over here in New Brunswick, we are just seeming to squeeze by without any zebra or quagga mussels. So we want to keep it that way. We would like to not have any mussels. As we can see, we have Quebec, we have some coming through in Maine. Um, yeah, so we're kind of moving around, but we can see the impacts that these invasive mussels would have. They would really start to you know, clog up water pipes if we had infrastructure, sewage pipes, things like that. It is bad news and obviously has a big cost. So as I said, just more pictures, human health impacts, all of these different things. And so a bit on how to ID this species, because I do want people to know what they're looking for out there. Again, very, very small mussels. And the zebra mussel name comes from these stripes on the mussel. It has this pretty characteristic little striping like a zebra. Um, so they are triangular, both of them. They do have these kind of flat sides on the bottom. So they'll typically have, you know, one way that they'll kind of lay flat. Um, but really, we're just wanting people to be on the lookout for small little mussels that are tinier than what they have seen typically and don't look like a native mussel. And then another big one that I, you know, was kind of shocked about that when I first got into the invasive species world, I wasn't aware was invasive. But goldfish are actually a pretty big issue. And we are trying to really target people to not release them because this common aquarium species, we know it's widespread across Canada, across New Brunswick. We can't really control that. They're, you know, huge in the pet industry. They can tolerate some really low water quality. 
they're good at surviving in decreased, you know, quality areas, things like puddles, ponds, everything like that can rapidly grow. So this picture on the bottom, if you've heard of, you know, that goldfish grow to the size of their tank. Yeah, imagine a lake, imagine a river. So these goldfish will grow much, much larger than our native species, outcompete them for food. And again, the main issue is that people are dumping them into our water bodies. We actually did a great project here in Fredericton at Odell Park. We worked with a lot of great partners. Um, we have Don McAlpine here and um, Graham Ford from uh, UNB here, uh, all in the pond here doing a survey to figure out what exactly we had. The first step is figuring out what we're working with because this pond was overrun and is overrun with goldfish. You can see this little bucket here. This is just a small scoop. Goldfish and rosy redhead minnow. This place is overrun. So we have a lot of issues. And this is kind of some of the stuff that we're pulling out of there. So these were actually samples from this survey. So we can see much, much larger than we would find in our traditional aquarium. But we did have some examples here in the middle of them reverting back to their natural coloring that we would see. You know, in the wild, goldfish wouldn't be bright orange. That doesn't make sense for them dealing with predators. But, you know, they have this kind of greenish olive tone, um, silvery coloring. So you can see it was really interesting. Some of these fish were actually reverting back to that coloring already. So we've had a couple of generations within this pond. So the main part, what can we all do about it? Because as I said, humans unfortunately are some of the source of these issues, but our programming is all about enabling citizens to take action. So these two great programs that we have, sorry, I know I'm a bit late. Um, I'm just gonna highlight quickly. So Clean Drain Dry is our main one for aquatic invasive species. So Eurasian water milfoil is a great example. Things get caught up on your boat. Things get pushed into, you know, different parts of your ski or your fishing equipment, anything like that. Um, and then we also have Don't Let It Loose, which is targeting that not releasing aquarium species, not releasing your pets. So as I said, Clean Drain Dry, really just hitting all of those steps on all of your equipment to prevent these aquatic hitchhikers from coming along with you. So here is just a really good overview of all of those steps. We do have more information on our website um, and our website is undergoing a renovation. So hopefully getting posted soon. So make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, to I'll have our website linked at the end, but please make sure to follow up on all of these great programs and as well the Canadian Council on Invasive Species has a lot of great information on these programs. They are national programs. The idea is anywhere you go in Canada, you can see this same messaging, right? We put up our signs at marinas. We work, we go to fishing tournaments, things like that. We want people to get the same message all across the board, um, clean, drain, dry. So Eurasian water milfoil, as we learned, easily fragmented and spread through boats and recreation. So we want people to be removing any material they find on their boat. If you have access to a power washer in a perfect world, you can power wash your boat, remove any material, and then make sure to dry off your boat completely before moving it to a different area. Even things like zebra mussels, their eggs, they're actually invisible to the naked eye. And if they got caught in a droplet of water or something, they could survive out of water. So we really want to limit the spread of these invasive species. As we said, controlling them will be hard enough as is, so making sure they don't move even farther. So we try and get people to take the pledge. We go to fishing tournaments, as I said, different public events, really engaging the community in this. So don't let it loose to really uh, again, engage non-native pet owners, people who like to have exotic animals or different things. Uh, into their homes, not to release them because they can have really big impacts. So goldfish, as I mentioned, marbled crayfish is one. We actually had, again, in PetSmart, uh, an example of white river crayfish was accidentally brought in and they had it in the tank and it was all well and good. But if that crayfish was able to escape out, right, these accidental introductions that can happen through the pet trade, a largemouth bass, people moving them around for bait species or game fish, they like to fish smallmouth bass or largemouth bass, so they'll pick up a bass in a bucket and move it. Zebra mussels even being caught up on aquarium moss ball products, so they're even coming in this way. So we're trying to get people to make sure they really research their species before they get them. Make sure you know about where the species is from. If you can't care for it, make sure you follow these proper humane steps to make sure we're not just dumping our species into the environment because either they become invasive or they can't survive in the wild, so either option is not great. So here's kind of the overview of all the things that you as the 
you know, person on the ground can do to help prevent these aquatic invasive species that I've talked about quickly. So understanding the threats, I think we all understand they have big impacts, recognizing them. So I talked a bit about identifying them, making sure to clean, drain, dry, uh, don't let it loose, never release these animals or fish, uh, report new sightings of aquatic invasive species. So that's really uh, the big point is if you do see some of these things, let us know. We want to know because then we can hopefully do something about it quickly. So reporting invasive species is really easy. We are working on getting a provincial system that will be focused on ex invasive species exclusively. But right now we have iNaturalist. So if you can go on your phone or on the website, iNaturalist.ca, create a free account, you just upload a photo of your species. So if you see something by your dock or you see something fishing, you're not sure, upload it on iNaturalist, get a couple of photos. It can, you know, you can say what you think it is. Experts on there will also come and confirm, yes, that's this species or no, I think it's this. But big other point is if you observe things like zebra mussels, quagga mussels, largemouth bass or Asian carp, we want you to contact the Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So they have their information there. But it is one of those things where it is really key that we find out quickly and that we, you know, try and do something really rapidly when it comes to these species. So working into these early detection, rapid response. Okay, and I'm so sorry, I've gone five, six minutes over, but thank you so much for having us. Again, we're really excited to be a part of this event. We think it's great. Cannabacasis has been such a great partner in taking action on invasive species in New Brunswick. We're really excited to work with them in the future and continue to do some of these great initiatives and pilot projects because that's how it starts working with community groups and engaging local partners so really excited to do more of that so if you work with a local organization or you yourself you know have some community volunteers that want to get involved please reach out my information is there as i said i am the project coordinator so we are looking to do a lot more on the ground activities work with partners to get more invasive species management happening on the ground in New Brunswick. So anyways, thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to you, Laura. If you have any questions, please email me or I can hopefully answer them in the chat, but thank you so much. Yeah, so we do have a few more minutes for some questions if there oh, are. Oh, perfect. Okay, I didn't wanna to go too long. I hopefully was like, I was rushing a bit at the end. <laughs> Unfortunately, my camera has decided to not work. So oh, hey, you guys I'll can't just show my it. face. <laughs> But yeah, if there's any questions, feel free to either put up your hand or put them in the chat. And I will just, I didn't have a slide in there, but I will plug another program we do have is our Buy Local, Burn Local. So we did mention with Hemlock Willie Adelgid and Emerald Ash Borer, all these forest pests, not moving firewood and wood products is huge. So if you are going camping, if you have a wood lot or you have a cottage that you bring up a bunch of wood, please make sure to buy local, burn local. So really, if you can source your wood close to where your cabin is or where you're moving, or make sure to buy certified pest-free. I know it's not the most environmentally friendly, but they do sell kill and dried wood that is sold in plastic bags, typically, that is certified pest-free so that you know there's no invasive species in there. So that's always a great option too. But yeah, there's Ben, so I'll let him take it back. <laughs> No, Shelby, I actually just had a little bit of a question for you. Yeah. And, uh, just on prioritization, I guess, of, um, you know, when, when we take action, is there any um, effort by the NBISC, I guess, to look at um, prioritizing um, action versus reward? So, you know, mm. you talk about the high cost of taking action on these species, but at, at some points, like for zebra, or zebra mussels, for example, yeah. the cost of not taking any action is quite costly as well. Has yeah. there been studies done or is the NBIC looking at creating, you know, a bit of a, a scenario for that within New Brunswick? Thank you for that amazing segue, Ben, because yes, we are hoping to do a risk assessment for zebra mussels, particularly as part of a project we pitched to Environmental Trust Fund. So again, hoping for some federal funding, but to coordinate invasive species monitoring within the groups like yourself. So hoping to implement some of that, but do a risk assessment for zebra mussel and kind of break it down and say, okay, which lakes are at the highest risk? Do they have a public boat launch? Do they have the water chemistry that's, you know, cohesive for zebra mussel growth? Do they have some of these other factors? And then create a prior prioritization, really. That'll be a good practice for us, I think, to work through, you know, an early detection rapid response system. 
for a species, because that's really what we need is, okay, so this species is on the horizon in New Brunswick, we're not too sure. Okay, so what's the plan when it arrives? What happens? Who is contacted? Who is engaged? What needs to happen? Because yeah, unfortunately, those conversations haven't really been happening at the government level, at the federal level. So that's where we're trying to come in and scoot it up a bit and say, hey, look, this is really good. You know, and the DFO has done a risk assessment for zebra mussels more large scale. And now I think they're taking it in finer. So we're going to hope to see how, oops, sorry, how my camera didn't go. But, you know, hopefully we're going to to do a, you know, more intensive, how does this actually look? My dream would be to create decision trees like I've seen in great other, you know, organizations, right? So you have this invasive species or you have this much of it. What's the next step? right? Best management practices really is what we need to get to. And as we said, increasing capacity, increasing the ability for people to know about these things and be concerned is really fueling this fire. So we have Claire now, our communications and outreach coordinator. So we are growing and it's a really promising time for invasive species management. And as I said, I hope our my role, especially to do more work with watersheds, work with, you know, groups. So I have this invasive species on my property. So we're working with Nature Trust as an example. Yeah. They bring us their maps and they say, I have this species at risk here. And we have Barbary. So what's the best way to do this? How is the best way to manage this? And this is kind of in a perfect world, we would get to a point where we can offer these invasive species management plans for people, but they're very intensive documents, very, very involved, lots of surveying and of course personalized recommendations. So I think getting a bit more of a framework in place at first for now is a good idea. With the, with the zebra mussel thing, I think it's a good species that's a uh, high concern. It's got good publicity. I think it'll be easy. It'll be easier to move that along. So I'm excited to see the results. I was going in a little di different direction, but maybe it's a conversation yeah. better to take offline and, and, yeah, yeah. and I'll maybe have that conversation as well, just because the cost scenario for municipalities and how to leverage support from the municipalities. Oh, on, yeah. No, financially. Yeah. yeah. You want to talk so. to Kristen if it's about my, making financial decisions. Yeah, no, that, More, that's yeah. cool. No, no cool. yeah. No, listen, well, thank you very much uh, yes. you for, for the presentation tonight. And uh, thanks for having uh, us. I think what we'll try to do is I don't see any hands up or questions in the chat. So. What we're going to do if and if people will have your email address, I hope. So yeah. uh, if they have questions, I can put they, it in the chat. Yeah, perfect. Uh, OK, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to pass it back over to Laura and Laura, we can't see your face, but hopefully you can share your screen. Can you share your screen? Um. Yeah, it looks like I can. OK, perfect. So everyone can see the correct screen, I hope. You're good, Laura, yeah. Awesome. So for tonight's last presentation, I'll be going over aquatic invasive species that the Canopy Cases Watershed Restoration Committee is looking at and the efforts that we're doing. And once again, this may be repetitive, but we want to thank DFO because without their funding, we wouldn't be able to complete any of the work with invasive species here at the KWRC and my position as the invasive species coordinator. So tonight I'll be going over uh, our education outreach plan and dip into kind of our aquatic part of our website development for invasive species. And then I'll move on to our priority species that we're looking at right now, which is Eurasian water milfoil and what we have done in the past for EWM, what we're currently working on through the Aquatic Invasive Species Fund and our future projects that we hope to complete which all depends on future funding as well. So for education outreach, some of this may be a little repetitive from last night, but more geared towards our aquatic goals. So again, we want to make sure we're not only educating the public, but also our staff. So learning how to identify invasive species that are here in the aquatic regions, as well as invasive species to come that we want to be looking out for. So how we can identify EWM and the zebra and coelho mussels. And then we also want to train them on avoiding areas that are highly dense, like have high dense areas of invasive species. So if we're ever out kayaking, doing any river observations, we want to make sure we avoid areas of 
EWM so that we are preventing the spread. And we're going to participate in clean, drain, dry. So we are also reducing spread there because we really want to show the public that we're doing the best we can and it's simple to do it and that if we can do it, they can do it. So for public education wise, so far we've developed a Eurasian water milfoil fact sheet, which is seen on our slide here. And we delivered that through a few different areas in the watershed that has EWM. And we've also completed a watershed walk. If you don't know, it's kind of like a vlog style or information style YouTube channel. And then we also have some dream, dr clean drain dry signs posted at some of our boat launch launches within the watershed. And we also want to complete some more outreach education at different days like NB Angler Day, if there's any fishing derbies, as well as spend a few days at boat launches and also attend farmers markets in the future. So for our website, we have two main species that we're focusing on, which will cause huge ecological damage as well as economical. So currently we have Eurasian water milfoil and we're also focusing on one species to come, which is the zebra and coaga mussels. And we're not limited to just these two species on our website. Hopefully our website will continue to develop as different invasive species come to our watershed. So we'll have the different species profiles. So how everyone can identify them when they're outside, out and about and the different impacts that they have economically, socially, as well as environmental. And for Eurasian water milfoil, we have it here around the Kennebecasis River at Darlings Island in Hampton. And then we also want to share information on how to reduce the spread. Since we know it's here, we're not going to eradicate it, but we want to make sure we are managing it to the best of our abilities and not adding to the spread. And then for zebra mussels, which currently isn't in New Brunswick, we want to make sure that we have early detection. So the more people that can identify it, the more likely we are to be on top of the problem. So prevention is the best way of management. So it would be devastating if it is here and if it went identified for a while when we have all these resources here. So for our past efforts for Eurasian water milfoil, we have attended a few events. We were at Fish and Bee Day last year, and we were at a few local farmers markets. We really want to continue to do that work, but we've also, like I mentioned early, earlier, handed out Eurasian water milfoil fact sheets to our residents in areas around Darlings Island and Hampton. And in the summer of 2020, we undertook a large map, large area to map the invasive species. So they kayaked from Bloomfield all the way down to Perry's Point, which is about 25 kilometer distance between those areas. And we partnered with the Hammond River Angling Association, as well as the Belle Isle Watershed Correlation to complete this work. So we used kayaks and we identified the areas using GPS points and recorded the infested regions. So there was two different infestation um, definitions, so dense areas as well as scattered individuals. And we also took samples while we were in the field so that we could correctly identify them when we came back to the office and we could send them off to get identified as well. So we went into Darling, Darlings Island as well, the lake there, since there had been sightings there before. So what we found from this was that there was 370 acres of dense Eurasian water milfoil patches throughout the area, as well as 79 acres of scattered individuals. And this is obviously from 2020, so the population has most likely grown and expanded from this time. And some areas of the scattered individuals may have turned into dense mats. And the stretch is between Lower Norton all the way to Perry's Point. There was none up in Bloomfield. So the population dynamics, like I mentioned, may have changed and the spread has obviously occurred since people are less aware and hopefully with it more aware, we'll have less spread. So in total, there's 449 acres, which if anyone else thinks like me in hectares, that is 182 hectares, 
which is an extremely scary number as it was only most recently identified. Like Megan Bruce mentioned in 2018, she noticed it in this region. And to put that into perspective, who people don't really understand acres or hectares, is that that is about 340 NFL football fields worth of Eurasian water mill foil. So that is a crazy amount to try to manage for just a small organization like us, as well as a lot of area that has been taken over by this species and a lot of habitat change. So currently through the funding of the Aquatic Invasive Species Program, which is my position right now, the Invasive Species Coordinator, I'm trying to determine their relationship between Eurasian water milfoil and the two native sturgeon species. So the two sturgeon species we have in the Kent of Cases River is the short nose sturgeon as well as the Atlantic sturgeon. And these are both culturally significant species and species protected under the Species at Risk Act. So we want to figure out, does EWM have a positive impact, a negative impact, or no impact at all on the sturgeon? And we're doing this through literature research. And so far, there hasn't been much for exact correlation between the two species. So we're having to infer and kind of determine what impacts Eurasian water milfoil has on an aquatic ecosystem and how that could be applied to the sturgeon. And we also want to try and develop a management plan for Eurasian water milfoil since the Kenneth Cases River is such a beautiful river and Eurasian water milfoil is a devastating invasive species. So for our management plan, we would like to include prevention methods as well as continue monitoring, an educational portion, and we'd like to develop a pilot project which we are currently developing and then also have some signage developed hopefully in the future so that the public is aware of what Eurasian water milfoil is so not only have clean drain dry but the reasons why we have clean drain dry and then we want to promote management by landowners and possibly focus our on the ground management in areas of high recreation and boat launches. So the two sturgeon, as I mentioned, are short nose sturgeon and Atlantic sturgeon, and they're both considered special concern under the Species at Risk Act in Canada due to their slow growing nature, as well as they are late maturing species. And these species are not found in the rest of Canada, except for, well, by that, I mean, the Atlantic sturgeon, the subpopulation only breeds in the St. John River. So that would be the maritime subpopulation. And for the short nose sturgeon, it is actually only found in the St. John River system. So that means it breeds in the St. John River, as well as goes up its tributaries, as well as down to the estuary, which is the intertidal zone. So the short nose sturgeon inhabits this area over the winter in the Kennebecasis hence the Sturgeon Alley name of the part of the Canvacasis. So it likes to overwinter in the shallow sandbar areas. And here they don't typically feed, but the Atlantic Sturgeon tend to migrate through this area and they forge as well as they stay in the deeper areas. And both of the Sturgeon stay within the, the low salinity areas. So they don't venture as far up as Bloomfield. They tend to stay within the Hampton and Darlings Isle Island region. And so far with the research that I've completed, there has been some interactions which are negative that Eurasian water milfoil will have on the species. So as Megan Bruce mentioned, the Eurasian water milfoil creates really dense color colonations so it would be difficult for these large species that can grow up to like six meters in length to navigate through a dense colonization of EWM and this could impact the overwintering habitat so if the sandbars do come infested with Eurasian water milfoil that will then push the sturgeon out of this area since they no longer have the habitat needed 
and they may then have to go to other rivers or find other aggregations, but this is the only known large aggregation site for the short-nosed sturgeon over the winter, as well as the introduction of a dense species can change benthic invertebrate composition. So this could change the type of forging done within the region by the Atlantic sturgeon. And with most of the river being taken over by this and the sturgeon not actually being able to enter these areas, it will decrease their habitat and decrease areas where they can ford, which makes it really difficult and makes it less likely for sturgeon to return to this area, as well as the different temperature and flow change that Eurasian water milfoil could potentially have an adverse effect on the sturgeon, although sturgeon are very old, so they could adapt to these changes in temperature as well as flow, but it is unsure since Eurasian water milfoil is a newer invasive species here. So for our future initiatives, we are really trying to implement our pilot project and hopefully be able to partner with other organizations as well as with the government or municipalities to really push having management completed. And we want to make sure we have an open discussion between the public as well as these government bodies and organizations so that we can really gather as many resources as possible and as many funding bodies so that we can actually really make a difference. And we really want to explore the management options for waterfront property owners. If they have Eurasian water mill foil, what they can do, how they can kind of regain the waterfront um, their waterfront property again because Eurasian water milfoil has been shown in other recent regions to decrease the real estate, re, decrease the housing market. So like it is kind of undesirable to buy a home that is infested with Eurasian water milfoil that is waterfront. So we really want to make sure we open that discussion and hopefully we are able to implement a pilot project and of course, everything that we are hoping to do all depends on funding since we are a nonprofit. And we also want to continue to develop the educational material that we have. I would like to see us go into different schools since lately you find your kids come home. Everyone always asks, what did you learn about today? And potentially having us as a guest speaker, we could plant the seed in the children who will hopefully bring up to their parents and also grow up thinking that, you know what, this is actually a really good idea. And it really starts fostering those connections with nature as well. And we'd like to develop some more fact sheets as well as continue to spread our awareness and hopefully push for more signage as well as more push for everyone to get the knowledge to attend different events. And as I mentioned earlier, we would love to continue to grow our invasive species page on our website and include more invasive species and more um, resources for everyone in the watershed. And we want to continue to monitor the spread and distribution of EWM within the Canvacasis River. And we want to really push people avoiding areas and growing their knowledge of invasive species. So increasing knowledge of the mussels as well as EWM, avoiding infested areas to reduce spread. So it's really important that we push identification and the impacts in early detection, since early detection is the best form of management. Because if we don't have to put in a large amount of money, which it would cost to remove, rather than hand out papers or have an internet website dedicated for it, costs a lot less than the millions of dollars spent on removal. And one of the last things we'd like to do is continue our partnership with MBISC and create a partnership with St. Mary's. So hopefully we can do some more sturgeon work within the Canabacasis and determine more on the ground interactions of sturgeon and Eurasian water milfoil rather than just literature reviews. So, other than that, I'd like to thank our funders for everything that we do here since we're a non-government agency and a non-for-profit. 
So everything we do is based on funding, all the positions. We have five positions right now, which wouldn't be possible without the federal government, as well as the provincial and other funding agencies. And also to our volunteers that help out a lot and make a lot of our work here possible, like all the tree planting events that we hold, as well as everyone coming out and learning tonight without you guys we wouldn't really be doing our full job and we wouldn't be fully capable of spreading word. So I know that was a bit of a shorter presentation than last night, but I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask anything and I'd be glad to answer. Thanks, Laura, I really appreciate that. Um, so as you guys can uh, all see, and I'll give you all an opportunity to hopefully type in the chat if you have any questions about, oh, Meg, you have your hand up. Is that a new one or is that uh, still that residual hand? It's a new one, Ben, calling in from the couch this time. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, speak to how much I appreciate the diversity in the projects that you're undertaking. So you're you're looking at things from the localized impacts of Eurasian water milfoil and investigating that and that's wonderful and the other aspect you brought up that I, I really liked was the local potential management for the waterfront and property owners uh, and I wanted to share something that people may not have experienced if they haven't been a part of the public meetings that I've been a part of and that's that moment where the public speaks up in desperation to reclaim their property and making their own management decisions without the education behind it. So I've heard some pretty horrific things for things that people are doing to manage your Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, and I, but I'm compassionate for the property owner because I understand that they're just doing the best that they know out of desperation. So things that I have heard include towing an old bed mattress frame behind a jet ski, creating their own underwater lawnmower, not knowing to contain fragments and going downstream, not knowing the importance of a Wawa permit. I've heard people ordering these mats, on, benthic mats online that they roll out, not understanding that like we have potential cyanobacteria issues uh, associated with that and water quality issues associated with that. Also, if they wash down river, uh, and then the other one was the application of herbicides. So in summer low flows, someone once said to me at a meeting, oh, I don't dump herbicides in the water. I wait till the water level drops and I just dump it directly on the plant. But inevitably the water comes back up and the herbicides go in the water. And I have no idea what they were using. And I, I rest assured they probably weren't necessarily considering the ecosystem of impacts of those chemicals that they added to the water and the other living things. But these people are making these decisions because that's the best they can do with the knowledge that they have at that time. So it's really important to continue that education and outreach and then offer um, maybe those suggestions and talk about what a Wawa permit is <laughs> and that that these decisions are made um, with a procedure for a reason. So that work is really, really important. So thank you for continuing that initiative in your region. Um, and that's only, I think, going to continue to increase in, in importance with the increased awareness. So good, good range of projects you have on the go. And uh, I'll do whatever I can to support you in, in making them happen because I think they're important. Well, I'm glad you said that, Mike, because after making that statement, because you, you've nailed a, a couple of key parts of the education and conversation that we're going to have as we move forward. We don't pretend to know it all. And but what I do want to be able to say is we can find the right answers. And by partnering with groups like yours and and with the NBISC, hopefully we can all come put our heads together and really frame up and, and strengthen that conversation and strengthen those tools that we provide to the public. What we want for those landowners in in, in along Darlings Island and Chris Pemsis and that area is they'll come to us and say before they undertake their own, you know, before they get that desperate and undertake their own action without doing any research they'll come to us and say hey listen i heard you guys have some great resources what do i need to know and then that's the way we we foresee this rolling out uh, again it, it's we're only going to be as successful and can only sustain it as long as we can create the need from government to continue our support that's a whole nother question i know i'm not trying to uh, to all of you people we're not crying hard times here at the kwc we do fairly well as a nonprofit organization 
because we have a long and strong history and, and we're grateful for that. But we need to be able to continue that, especially with these new threats, because invasive species for us is a new avenue and a new threat that we've recently identified that we're starting to address. So that, that's important. And if we look at New Brunswick compared to what's going on around us, we can see what's looming. So we can use examples from what's going on right now to prepare ourselves. I don't yeah. think there's going to be any shortage of work, but we're actually in a pretty good position to keep New Brunswick as it is and protect it and make sure that our fresh waters don't face some of the bigger issues that are all around us. If we can be diligent in this and we have uh, groups like yours working out on the water, then that is really the best that we can do. And so that's what always gives me a little bit of comfort for, for New Brunswick. And I know that it seems like it's all doom and gloom when we're talking about issues like invasive species and habitat loss and threats, but we really are pretty lucky to have the fresh waters in the state that we do in this province, but we want to keep it that way. Right, sure and do. that's what work like the work of your organization will do. So uh, keep it up. Keep okay. going. Great. Thanks. And and with that, it, I don't see any questions. Uh, any other? Oh, um, Shelby's typing in something there, but I don't see any further questions coming in. Uh, I don't want to keep anybody any longer than I have to. Uh, I realize that it's uh, 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 getting late into the night. I do want to say thank you to our all of our presenters. Um, I encourage you, if if you're a member of the public and you have questions, reach out to these presenters tonight, or feel free to reach out to the Canada Cases Watershed. Um, and uh, further, you know, if you're interested in helping out the KWRC or learning more, check us out on our website, CanadaCasesRiver.org. Uh, we're on Facebook, Canada Cases River, uh, and we're also on Instagram. And I provided a link to our YouTube channel. Um, Believe it or not, the, the social media posts, they, it's a metric that some of our funding partners look at for our success. So if you're liking us and following us on Facebook, that's that that's helping out. And if that's all you do, I'm thankful for that. But I also encourage you to send us an email and say, hey, I'd like to do a bio blitz or something to that effect later on as well. So to everybody, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm going to go home and watch the Montreal Canadiens hopefully beat the Buffalo Sabres. And uh, thanks again. And Laura, great job putting this all together. Thank you, Ben. And yes, everyone, enjoy your night and take care. And the recordings will be available very soon. Oh, good. Good lead in. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye now.